So I'm from Robotics Plus. Uh, we've got content now. And just have a look at how we think that's the potential for robotics to uh, change horticulture over time. So we're part of the Plus group of companies based in Tauranga, New Zealand, the Bay of Plenty. Um, it's a very vertically integrated company, right from orchard management, orchard ownership, right through pack house and uh, brand content as well. Now the Bay's actually a really nice facility for this sort of development as well. It's got a very strong entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, with the angel investment which Steve talked a bit about before, which adds a lot of uh, value and support into uh, the sort of development we're really working on. Horticulture is facing many challenges, and a lot of these are quite well known. Um, we're really lagging behind agriculture that has a lot of mechanisation. Uh, you know, we probably are that 80 to 100 years behind it because this is largely due to their growing systems. It's quite a simple growing system where it's relatively easy to apply mechanisation to perform those tasks that we require, and this has allowed them to scale quite rapidly. There is a growing trend, though, of wanting uh, high nutrient rich crops to feed that growing population that's been talked about quite a bit and the horticultural produce will supply that over time. I, th I think to date uh, how robotics will help with problems like labour is fairly well conceptualised. Uh, it's quite easy to have a look and say well if we can build a machine to do a certain task we can go apply it and a lot of our labour issues are gone. Uh, that will then translate through to the likes of yield security. We've suddenly got all the people we're required to do the task as the industry grows. We're suddenly not handling produce. Robots can be kept a lot cleaner for the hygiene side of it. And this whole discussion around big data and tracing where everything's come from is, is being discussed too. Where I want to look at is the waste side of the issue. And although I'm going to take a, an example from our kiwifruit industry, this is quite really broadly applied across horticulture. Uh, in our green crop, in our domestic market, so before we ship anything overseas, we are seeing $85 million worth of waste in our industry. Now this is only on one variety of kiwifruit um, in a billion dollar industry. So when you start to scale that problem up over a $100 billion industry, Globally, waste is a huge issue. It's also pushing towards the need for scalability and being able to feed this growing population. Suddenly, you know, well, half our effort's gone down the tubes. You know, you compare this to agriculture, which is sitting at about 15 to 30 percent waste. So their systems they've got in place are working a lot better for that sort of commodity produce out. So if we take the example of kiwi fruit. Um, and, and what I'm wanting to sort of show here is that we're very fragmented in our supply chain at this point. Uh, this season, uh, the on-orchard crop estimates for green kiwi fruit were out by about 15% and about 10% for gold. So suddenly we now have uh, pack houses scrambling to have enough space to, to push fruit through. Fruit's getting wasted uh, and many other problems there with that. The other aspect to it is Kiwi fruits harvested as bulk maturity areas. We sample some of them, we go through, strip pick the lot, pull it out, push it through uh, pack houses. Now, we're getting a lot of waste through that because we're taking all the small fruit, we're taking fruit that are all different maturities because we're treating it all big blocks the same, and we're expecting all that fruit to store the same and push through to our markets, and that's just not viable. So the elements of the supply chain aren't having that upstream, downstream feed forward feedback loop which we can really uh, look to achieve. Yeah, oh, wrong button on the clicker, it's a bit slow. So what I want you to imagine is having a world with drones, wirelessly connected orchards, robotic harvesting, robotic packing and automated pollination where we can go around and target apply pollen to specific flowers to get specific fruiting densities. Where we can use the drones and some of the robotic sensing technology and the orchard sensor is actually mapping the characteristics of the plants in the orchard system and we can start looking to define specific maturity areas depending on the plant characteristics instead of treating them as all big broad acre cropping. 
and then looking at that application of it through the value chain. So although these are, um, some of them aren't new ideas, it's the application of them that's coming through. And these are actually all systems that we're working on as part of PLUS Group. So we're looking at that full value chain system and how to push it through. And although there's great opportunity for these systems to be applied in the individual sense, at the individual tasks of, yeah, we can do some mapping and we can, we can do some analytics and we can monitor some plants. It's the integration of these elements through the value chain that is really where you're going to get the value add from this technology. Yes, we'll get value and big value from the individual components, but being able to integrate them through that value chain to a audit back upstream in the value chain to send information back as quality control, or feed forward to let them know what's coming up. There's a lot there that we can do. And my graphs are on the, on the right there. It's more to show that disruptive technology trend. You know, we might be immature in some areas with our technology, but that development path is going to become quite more rapid, and you're going to see that technology surpass your current systems quite quickly with the development that's going on around the world. The other part to that is showing that you know, people have a lot of good insight which allows them to make uh, judgment on certain tasks and push those tasks through. But as those people need to start dealing with a lot of data, we just don't have the capacity on a, say, for kiwifruit, on a fruit-by-fruit -fruit basis, make individual decisions. We're trying to process too much. And that's really where the robotic integration into those systems is going to have a lot of value in being able to deal with that data and the sheer information that you're going to get bombarded with. We're just not going to be able to achieve this integration through the value chain um, with that systems. And genetics is going to have a big play in this game too. And I'll talk about some of that soon, but being able to adapt crops and their growing systems of those crops to be more amenable to automation is going to have a, a lot of value. But, but how do we achieve this? Um, I see two big main parts of this are the end user engagement. We really need to understand that problem. And part of that is working with them at an early stage before you even start conceptualising what's going on and find out what value you can add. Uh, for a lot of our developments, which we'll go through soon, um, we've actually worked at that to begin with. What value can we add? Well, this is the commercial application and potential for us. This is how much we could charge for our service or what we're doing which allows us then to work back in our development process to say, well, we've got to be able to build a machine at the end of the day that's this much, so it actually has commercial application. There's so many developments going on around the world that you know, their system's a couple hundred million dollars to build and it's some huge thing that is just not going to be practical to actually commercially apply. Yes, there'll be some development come out of it that's useful technology, but we really need to take that step of being able to apply that. Part of that for us is collaboration and being able to work with teams of people to actually join our knowledge together instead of battling away in individual elements and we'll show you how some of that's going on. The growing systems do need change and that's part of the end user engagement for me is actually working with the orchardists to get that engagement to push and have sort of that technology push user pull type approach of hey we need you to do some and here's some technology but we need you to do a little bit along the way to make so you can better utilise it. Although we're coming through with a lot of systems and saying we'll automate your current system, to get the long-term benefit out of that, we really need to look at how we can um, work together to get utilise the full potential. And as been mentioned a bit, we've got a lot of things like variability and environment to deal with. Uh, it's variability. Um, I come from an agriculture, grew up dairy farming, and coming into the horticultural sense of trying to automate something didn't quite understand at the beginning of how much variability it is. You know, you're even dealing with pre-sized and graded fruit in that one size profile, there's so many shape characteristics and everything. That's actually a big problem for uh, the automation side is understanding that and how your systems are developed to deal with that. But a big help coming through, I think, is things like uh, driverless cars. You know, the work of like NVIDIA and stuff at the moment with their deep learning systems and just massive computing power they can throw at. Uh, 
vision-based systems now, the sensors they're developing to actually work out in natural environments because there's a lot of the time where people are taking a standard robot arm or a standard camera and being like, I want you to work outside. It just doesn't happen most of the time. Some applications you can get away with that, but we just really need to be assessing whether that's the right approach for the individual applications. So I'm going to have a look at two pieces of technology we're currently developing. Uh, one's our multi-purpose orchard robotics. I'm um, engineer, so we don't really come up with inventive names for things. We'll get some branding people onto that. Um, and our apple packing cell. Hopefully this video plays and it isn't all jerky. Oh, we're good. So this is Kiwi Fruit Harvester, developed for, I think this video is about 2009, and unfortunately we had a, a, a bacteria come through in kiwi fruit, which means I couldn't really get onto orchards for a couple of years, and they went into a sort of survival mode, but we're now in a place where we're back developing this. Um, at the time, and I mean it still stands for some of it, uh, we got a nice bit of assessment coming out of Washington State University where they thought this was the most advanced piece of technology in the world for harvesting of individual fruit. And we're still getting a lot of support out of that space for this. So, you know, this is a few years old now of where we were. But it was really around developing a system to show that we had the capability to do this work. Built on very much of a shoestring budget. Um, and it was my doctoral thesis was based on this work, so it was quite a practical application of, of my side of the robotics. Got it working day and night, as said before, night time's so much better than the daytime, uh, but we are getting our systems to deal with that variability and the complexity of the growing systems. What we really want to see though is more of this two-dimensional structuring of the crops, being able to grow the crops and tie them down to um, make it more amenable to that automation. Sorry, you want to jump in? At this stage, it's just bulk stripping everything, but there is a lot we can do. For now, look, we want to solve the immediate problem, get our minimum viable product out there and, and get on with the task. Uh, but over time, we're definitely looking at how to integrate selective picking, non-destructive sensors for maturity, all these other things that I sort of talked about before will come through in that process. So this is our cohort team. Uh, so. We got uh, $10.5 million of funding from the New Zealand, oh well, 7.6 from the New Zealand government and then the rest is private investment. Uh, as a collaborative group between us and uh, two universities and the CRI, it's a four year project looking to continue this technology. Uh, we're 21 engineers and eight industrial partners working on this together to solve these problems. So we're coming together with a lot of expertise in that area. Um, where the core of that technology is really this multi-purpose platform. And fortunately, I can't show you the video of some of it. We've got a few confidential things floating around at the moment. But the idea with this platform is it's an autonomous platform. It's all a uh, hybrid drive system in it. But we end up with this big sort of bare midsection in the machine where we can attach different task performing systems, whether they be harvesting arms, whether they be targeted pollination systems, whether they be thinning systems, whether it's scouting units, um, we've suddenly got this core capability that we can push across on that. Um, we've had the new arm out harvesting this year as well, so we hopefully soon we'll have a bit more updated video, but this system, is most of it's built, but it's just underway. Might be a slightly confusing video, sorry, but this is um, a smaller scout robot with our navigation system built onto it. So as that uh, platform's navigating around the orchard, yes it is sped up, that sort of couple hundred metre long section of orchard, it's taking the two dimensional uh, data that we're, well the three dimensional data we're collecting on the orchard and turn that into a 2D representation of our key features that we can use for navigation and positioning and a whole heap of other tasks in the orchard. So that's the core of what's driving the, um, the platform. You can see there's a water tank in the corner here and it's all surrounded by hedges. We're picking up a lot of that information as we're going. Our second main product, and this is about, um, about to be commercially released, is our apple packing cell. Our target was to pack 120 apples a minute, be able to orient the fruit to horizontal, so then we can pick them up, place them in the trays, all in the same orientation, with colour side up if they want, let's use a selectable, 
which allows us to have a, a nice presentation pack that can be pulled out and displayed in the supermarket, which is becoming uh, in demand a lot more. Uh, then also automatic tray recognition. So any tray type we feed into this machine, whether it's a different colour, uh, different size, or whatever, it can uh, detect and pack the trays into the box if they're crooked, whatever. And our, our goal was to outperform the people that <coughs> um, currently do this job and to fit onto a standard sorting system. I've just been showing it two minutes, so I better play the video quickly. So this was our machine when it was still in our um, development stage. Uh, we've had it running in a pack house in a full commercial operation for three months. We just brought it back actually to, for our further development. Uh, it packed about 1.4 million apples in a couple of months. It was not in their peak time of the season, so it wasn't getting fed the volume of apples that we would have liked. Um, but you can see along the back there where the pickup point, um, sorry these double screens, but hopefully you can pick that up. The apple's getting oriented in the back of the robot there. So there's eight lanes in parallel getting oriented where the, when that orientation is finished or when it's close to finishing, each lane goes, hey, I'm ready, robot, you can come pick me up. So everything's really optimised for pick and place around orienting apples to place them in the trays. Now, Steve, who you heard from earlier, has spent a lot of time travelling around pack houses throughout the US and New Zealand to really understand the problem and really understand what we needed to deliver from our technology standpoint to make a system that's viable uh, for that end user. And you can see we actually can set everything on the fly, the touchscreen interface is simple, but we can be doing traceability. Um, we can do biometrics of all the fruit going through that. We could be scanning each item of fruit and trace its provenance through the uh, value chain. Um, Next thing I want to do is labelling, because you can see the labels are coming out all over the fruit on these at the moment. It's sort of it's done upstream for us, but again, if we can do that labelling in line, we can add a lot of value to the presentation of these packs uh, longer term. So as with all our machines we're looking at, we're looking at deploying on a lease basis, um, which helps us uh, lower barriers to entry. It also keeps us engaged with that end user, which is really strong for us. Uh, at the current performance of this machine, we're looking at a less than a one-year payback on our build cost, which makes it quite an attractive model, but it also gives us a disruptive platform. Suddenly it's a platform that we could deploy other sensing technology onto uh, because we have got a position in that value chain and that um, supply chain. So. It allows us to integrate other systems into that longer term. So although this is our minimum viable product to get out there and get operating and get into the market, the picture is to have these systems in the longer term with other sensing technology. So we've got six units that are being in commercial construction now that will be in a pack house in the next month operating for the rest of the season. I'll give you a bit of user feedback. Within about an hour of them working, they're asking for the rest of them and whether we could start grading for them, <laughs> and a few other things. So it was, it was really nice um, engagement from the end user to actually push back some of that content and really be supportive of this process. Um, so we've got a lot of people really interested in this technology, wanting to push it through. So we're looking at our options now of how to really engage hard and, and scale strongly now to deploy this technology. So come and have a chat with it at some point. Steve's still here too, so um, we're the uh, founding team of Robotics Plus. <laughs>